historia del arte y es un reconocido especialista, eh, sobre todo en escultura. Ha trabajado y vivido en Italia durante mucho tiempo, formó parte del Instituto eh, Alemán de, de Florencia y ha ocupado distintas responsabilidades en varios museos de los Estados Unidos, en la National Gallery de Washington, en el Getty Museum o en el Museo de Minneapolis. Eh, ha sido galardonado con el Nicoleta V Premio Internacional de Galileo Galilei Foundation de Pisa y desde 2015 es director de la Galería de los Uffizi y después de verano asumirá la dirección del Kunsthistorisches Museum de Viena. Eike. Thank you very much, uh, Miguel. Now, um, the Uffizi, uh, I will be speaking about the Uffizi, of course, um, uh, uh, nowadays is not just the building of uh, the Uffizi, but it's actually the kernel of uh, the uh, Medici and then later Habsburg Lorraine uh, collections. Um, and you see uh, the Galleria delle Statue e delle Pitture, how it was called in the old days. Uh, here to the left, uh, which is part of it, and uh, the other main part of the uh, Grand Ducal and then later uh, Royal and Imperial collections was always housed in the uh, Pitti Palace, and in fact it is composed of several different um, uh, museum spaces, museum collections that are uh, together, including the Bobbly Gardens, which is not just a botanical collection, but also a collection of over 300 uh, uh, garden sculptures, uh, out of which uh, still the vast majority is uh, uh, original and uh, not uh, replaced uh, by uh, copies. And uh, they were uh, connected um, since 1565 uh, by the Zari Corridor, about which I will be speaking a little bit later too, and also just to give you a ballpark, well, no, a very precise uh, number. Uh, this year, for the first time, we reached 4.1 uh, million uh, visitors, so we do see the effects of massification. Um, in fact, uh, just um, uh, two weeks ago, we did celebrate our 250th birthday as a museum open to the public, and a special stamp uh, was issued um, here. Um, of course, in order to celebrate important birthdays, you usually resort to media, uh, traditional media, and of course, what medium could be more traditional and rela uh, related to the past than a uh, postage stamp uh, nowadays, since uh, we don't uh, need any postage stamps to send uh, WhatsApps or um, emails. Uh, uh, in fact, uh, uh, we uh, celebrated uh, this because in 1769, on St. John's Day, uh, June the 24th, uh, for the very first time, uh, the Uffizi, uh, it was not necessary to have a letter of recommendation anymore to get to the Uffizi, which you could just show up. However, uh, uh, just as in Vienna, you had to be decently dressed. That was written, um, uh, but it was not specified more uh, in, in detail. But we do know that scholars, uh, traveling artists, came to the galleries, and uh, uh, we have the visitor books. Uh, we do know, also know that in the 18th century, our average daily uh, visitorship was between five and 14 visitors per day. Um, that has slightly changed in the meantime. Um, and only on the day of St. John, when all the population was invited, all the families were invited, uh, that uh, was a difference. Uh, there were thousands of uh, visitors, indeed, uh, to the Uffizi. Um, and in fact, on that day, we um, changed our reception desk to be a postal office. We had um, philatelists come in from all over Europe to buy um, stamps on the first day of, of issue. Now, um, in fact, uh, this, these 250 uh, years makes us the oldest uh, of the four big um, Habsburg museums that there are in, in Europe. The uh, second oldest would be Brera, that also got a stamp for its 210th birthday about a month ago, and um, uh, of course Brera exists thanks to Maria Teresa of um, Habsburg, and um, it was open to the public 210 uh, years ago. The third one 
is the Prado and about the youngest sister we, 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 uh, we saw, saw and heard earlier uh, this morning. Uh, in fact, uh, it is important to uh, realize the role of the Habsburg family in making uh, the uh, Uffizi a modern uh, museum in the first place. The, uh, while we will not ever forget uh, the extremely important role of the Medici family in uh, bringing together co the collections since the middle of the 15th century and um, uh, already amassing such great treasures by the beginning of the 17th century uh, that it uh, became uh, the largest uh, family collection in uh, Italy at the time, doubling then thanks to, to the Della Rovera family. Uh, Vittoria Della Rovera brought uh, uh, their entire family collection when the Della Rovera family died out from Urbino and from Pesaro in 1631. Um, uh, but it was actually thanks to his father, uh, so Joseph II's father, um, uh, Francis Stephen, who made a deal with the last uh, Medici, uh, Anna Maria Luisa de Medici, the electress uh, Palatine, in 1737. Now, there are lots of uh, urban legends about uh, that uh, she would have uh, donated the collection to the city of Florence. That's actually not quite true. Um, uh, the uh, outgoing uh, family uh, of the Medici made a contract, uh, the so-called Pact of the Families, uh, with uh, Francis Stevens, and, and uh, looking at the genesis of this contract, actually it also becomes very, very clear how uh, this contract came about, because originally, um, well, Anna Maria would never have been in a position to make a donation because uh, she, the entire family indeed, was full of debt, and in fact, in order to fight off the risk to sell off and disperse the collections in the world, um, uh, this contract started, um, and it was through the negotiations that what initially was intended to not sell any belongings of the Medici actually uh, then concentrated on works of art, um, uh, works, uh, books, archival material, jewelry as well, and uh, artistic uh, heritage. Um, uh, so th theoretically mobile goods that however were tied to a specific uh, region, and that is to the city of Florence and to uh, Tuscany, as in fact it says in the uh, original documents in the third uh, article, and we see here uh, uh, the um, precise uh, wording of it. Uh, now what is uh, revolutionary from the history of uh, the uh, uh, law is indeed this a particular condition uh, that nothing would be ever transported or taken out of the capital or of the state of uh, the, the Grand Duchy, that is, of uh, Tuscany. However, and this is uh, indeed far more interesting for us today, um, Anna Maria uh, Luisa de Medici and Francis Stephen of Habsburg Lorraine already formulated um, uh, what was uh, probably the first mission statement for the Uffizi and, so, uh, and perhaps the first mission statement of a museum in the world, and that is what they uh, should do. So indeed, um, this is uh, Vittoria della Rovere, um, um, Anna Maria Luisa's grandmother, and in order, that would have been, of course, a second risk uh, that, um, uh, apart from selling and dispersing the collection, the second risk would have been theoretically that uh, just as her grandmother brought all the works from Pisa and Rubino to Florence, that uh, Francis Stephen might have uh, brought everything to Vienna. In that case, I would not be here to give this lecture, but Sabine would have covered it uh, this morning. Um, but that didn't um, happen. Uh, so indeed, uh, what is uh, the mission statement? It consists of three functions that are being assigned to the works of art. One is uh, uh, to be an ornament of the state. And of course, this is the most archaic 
definition of what art serves for. It's the lineage that we heard about, the state representation, um, the fact uh, that by displaying, as in fact already France, uh, uh, Francis uh, de' Medici, Francesco Primo de' Medici, uh, did from 1581 onwards, um, uh, displaying ancient statuary, uh, you would bring the family and uh, the collection into a, a lineage that goes back to ancient uh, Roman time, and this is what used to be the open loggia uh, from in the original plans of Giorgio Vasari from, 50, from the 1560s, and which then was closed with windows uh, by, uh, Franc uh, by Francesco I in, uh, at the beginning of the 1580s in order to uh, show the, the, the statuary. Of course, the ornament of the state also means that um, the architectural forms are much, much larger than you, that you actually need. You can imagine uh, that in the uh, period in the 1780s when uh, um, Pietro Leopoldo um, or Leopold II of um, Habsburg uh, built uh, this staircase um, for five to ten visitors, uh, you would not need it. It now comes in very, very handy that we have this large uh, staircase uh, today. Uh, and of course, all the ceremonies of the state in which the buildings play, uh, and also the artworks do play a fundamental role, such as the great annual um, festivities in honor uh, of the patron of Florence, uh, St. John the Baptist. Uh, then, however, and this is far more revolutionary because it already plays to uh, ideals that would become uh, primary in the following decades in the, uh, during the Enlightenment, but which go back to the Renaissance itself. It's also for the utility of the public. Now that is uh, very new, and then this might seem to be the most revolutionary of all, also to attract the curiosity of tourists. Uh, so in 1737, uh, uh, that was already uh, on the agenda um, of uh, uh, Francis Stephen and Anna Maria uh, Luisa. Now, um, uh, in fact, uh, the utility of the public is a, f uh, is a formula which you find in inscription sometimes for libraries, such as the um, Medici Library of San Lorenzo, and this is, of course, not the Medici Library of San Lorenzo, but these are photographs taken by Massimo Listri in a monographic exhibition that just opened a few days ago uh, that show uh, the a new sacristy by Michelangelo, but also the uh, Medici Library, uh, and we have this formula there, but also uh, it is frequent, or it occurs for um, a more practical utility such that of public water, uh, such as in the inscription of Gian Bologna's Fountain of Neptune in Bologna. So it is a standing formula, the uh, utility of uh, the public. Um, in fact, uh, even the Medici itself had uh, for the medals which uh, were cast uh, for the cornerstones of the Uffizi 5060 uh, by Domenico Poggini had uh, this allegory uh, which combines justice and wealth uh, with the facades which were not built obviously at the time yet um, uh, behind it of the Uffizi uh, of course and had publica commoditate as uh, the inscription but, and this is very important, the other center of the Medici collection, or the uh, Palazzo Pitti, had quite the opposite, and that is Pulchiora Latin, so the um, more beautiful are um, uh, actually not visible, they are hidden behind the rustic facade of Palazzo Pitti. So this is, uh, is really the opposite of accessibility and of the ideals that then were first formulated in a more concrete way uh, indeed by Pietro Leopoldo um, of Habsburg. And in fact, um, we have a mixture of both, uh, to, uh, of both these principles, of uh, both these missions, uh, represented in the very famous, uh, but totally fictional, um, uh, and, and it's, it's really the, not at all comparable to, to an Instagram photograph of these scholars in the 18th uh, century. Fortunately, I would also say, because we do know from the visitors' books that uh, we had a lot of female visitors, but here you only see uh, men uh, looking and, uh, at the paintings and sculptures, and you only see English noblemen, in fact, and a few Italians mixed amongst them. So this is a particular uh, view. Or in Thomas Patch's e almost equally famous um, 
and even more fictionalized representation of uh, the amateurs, the art lovers around the Medici Venus. This is, uh, in fact, a mixture of three of the most famous sculptures from the Tribuna with what is now room 35 or the Leonardo uh, Gallery, uh, which had this niche uh, behind and still today has uh, this checkered floor, uh, which we also saw uh, a bit earlier in the um, uh, Medici Library. And uh, uh, in fact, I mean, what uh, what happens under Peter Leopold? Um, uh, after he arrives in Florence uh, from, uh, from Vienna in 1765, not even eight months later, in the spring of 1766, he first opens uh, the Bobbly Gardens for the public uh, on certain days a week, and then in 1769, uh, the Uffizi, and he installs the first uh, museum director and also the first um, deputy uh, director. And the first um, uh, Uffizi directors actually also even got their portraits um, in the portrait gallery of the Joviana series in, in the Uffizi. Here we see um, Luigi Lanzi, the second, and Tommaso Puccini, the fourth uh, director. And uh, here we see also the, uh, uh, the uh, third and the fifth. What we don't have is actually uh, the first uh, director here, but uh, he is actually replaced by someone who at the time might have been far more important, which is Giuseppe Eckel or Josef Eckel, uh, who was the keeper of the numismatic uh, collection. And in the 18th century, of course, numismatics was the most important discipline uh, amongst all uh, the art historical and archaeological uh, disciplines. And in fact, he was also the first director who then, after serving in Florence, uh, was called um, to uh, head the uh, numismatic uh, collection in Vienna. And uh, so he uh, uh, went uh, to, uh, to Vienna. Uh, this is uh, the project uh, which, uh, like in Vienna, following the same model, uh, in fact, the idea was also to pr produce a work of engravings of the collection. It never came to that, but we do have uh, several, uh, well, Fortunately, we can now call them installation views that uh, show how, uh, and they, they would have been part of that uh, work, which then was, was not uh, published uh, by uh, Benedict Vincenzo de Grees. Um, under um, under uh, Leopold II, the Uffizi was made accessible to everyone, and its mission, in fact, was uh, dedicated to research and education. And this uh, is clear from many, many documents, uh, uh, which uh, the, the first and the second director of the Uffizi um, uh, speak about this double mission of research and education. Uh, the Uffizi's collection was also doubled, as you see on the western side. All these galleries were, were added, including the large uh, room, uh, which were, was dedicated to the Nyabid figures um, over here. Um, and in fact, I mean, this is something that uh, we, these three, these three criteria, these three missions is something that we uh, also um, uh, took um, as guiding stars for, for our own uh, mission when we wrote our mission uh, statement uh, three years ago. And in fact, uh, in terms of accessibility of uh, research education, um, uh, we uh, did a number we implemented a, a, a number of strategies. One is that we uh, installed uh, benches. Uh, there, there was hardly the possibility for the visitors to sit down in the Uffizi uh, before. We installed 40 benches last uh, year, um, uh, always in the windows, which is the exact principle of the Renaissance to install benches uh, in the window uh, niches so people can actually sit down uh, in front of the paintings and paint and uh, make drawings or make take take notes, talk to one another. Uh, we also added uh, new labels, or in many cases, the first labels at all, because the, uh, historically it is uh, 
a bit counterintuitive, but it is um, a fact that the ancient statuary did not have any labels. The reason is uh, very evident, because in the 18th and even in the 19th century, people thought that these sculptures were so famous that they wouldn't need any labels. Everyone would have learned about them in um, school already. Um, so only the paintings, which were believed to be less famous, in fact, got uh, labels. So we um, made away that and installed labels for the sculptures too, and we uh, in fact, at the same time, started to roll out a completely new uh, labeling uh, project. We installed um, new spaces for study, uh, such as uh, the uh, study room for the um, cabinet of prints and drawings, uh, which uh, opened in uh, March uh, 2016. Um, in, in order to foster that, you can uh, actually use this also as a seminar room. Um, and in um, January 2017, uh, we opened uh, uh, an auditorium for the, for the first time. And in order to reach the public, uh, which is in fact a challenge if you have uh, 4.1 uh, uh, million visitors, the vast majority being tourists, uh, we started uh, to have a lecture series every uh, Wednesday afternoon, so today I'm uh, missing uh, that lecture in, in, in Florence, but they actually videotape it, so I'll be able to, to see that um, uh, in the next few, few days. And it's totally free, so uh, the idea is really to uh, be entirely barrier-free and uh, 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 to be open, of course, for uh, all the Florentines, but also all the scholars and everyone who's interested who might come in and walk in. Uh, there. So last year we had the first 32 uh, lectures plus four um, international conferences and um, now it's going to be 52 um, conferences of course. So same thing with publications, book publications. Uh, in fact, uh, we have really stepped up not just um, exhibition catalogs but uh, others. So we, last year alone we published 24 five titles. Uh, with uh, combined 6,500 pages of, of scholarly prose. And um, uh, what's also new is that uh, we published 16 uh, titles in more than one language. So, so, um, uh, and we had seven languages of which English, indeed, was the most uh, frequent one. So all the seven uh, books had an English edition. And several of them had uh, other uh, um, had addition in, in, in those other languages uh, of which you see the flags, including, of course, uh, Spain. So here uh, is just a selection uh, of these. But also online, uh, we uh, stepped up cataloging our collection. And so um, uh, every year now, we are cataloging almost 2,000 new works of art, plus we update uh, between 16 and 20,000 um, uh, catalog entries uh, in our system, and by now we actually have cataloged already over 300,000 uh, works of art which are t um, uh, accessible uh, through your cell phone wherever you are uh, in the world. Uh, one field, again, which got inspired by the original mission of uh, the Uffizi Galleries is uh, the uh, didactic um, uh, initiatives and cultural mediation. Now we have every day uh, visitors from over 100 different countries. Um, and we, we did this on various different levels. Uh, we um, issued three um, Uffizi-based uh, social uh, games, like card games or so, um, our, our version of Monopoly, the Firenzopoli. And um, then we had 881 different um, didactic activities with almost 20,000 participants last year. This is really a growing number. Uh, when I arrived, we had three people in this department. Now we have 30 people in the department, plus uh, we have another 30 independent uh, people whom we can um, hire for particular uh, projects. Uh, and so this is really very, very fastly growing. Um, in fact, there was only one um, lab or classroom for, for this, and at the moment we're uh, building a new educational uh, center with six classrooms so we can have six activities in parallel um, and that should be opening at the end of 2020 or early 2021 and in between 2021 and 22 we will also be opening another 
um, to uh, another eight classrooms uh, within the museum. So it will be a total of um, uh, 14 uh, classrooms uh, all together. Uh, we also um, um, we also installed a new uh, department that deals with accessibility and cultural mediation, which uh, already did 173 uh, activities last year with uh, 1,300 participants from different cultures. Uh, this is also uh, vastly growing, plus uh, we involved uh, 1,200 high school students uh, in internships uh, last year, and the internships uh, uh, they go from the fall when uh, they participate in regular activities and museum visits, and then for two weeks in the summer at the end of the school year, uh, the uh, high school students actually uh, provide uh, guided tours in different languages. So it's not just art, but it's also their language, um, their foreign language capacity, and, and also their social interaction. Uh, for many of them, it's for the first time that they actually teach someone who comes in and who's much older, much more senior, and uh, we know that this is a very, very positive experience for, uh, for many, uh, many of the students. Um, again, the, the internet, we did not even have an internet uh, website, probably the last, uh, not big museum, but the last museum in the world that didn't have an uh, internet uh, website when I uh, started uh, at the end of 2015. Now we do have uh, one, um, and these are last year's numbers, they're much higher this year, but we already had 1.3 individual um, users and 7.7 .7 million pages visited. Uh, for a duration of three minutes and a half, which is not too bad, actually, considering uh, that that's, this is a, a median number, uh, because it really means that some people really spent several, several hours um, uh, with uh, these programs, because others just go to buy their, uh, their tickets. Um, and um, uh, yes, this can all continues to grow. Uh, we launched 12 virtual exhibitions, so this is, these are uh, exhibitions, and if you'd like to, you can uh, look at that, at that from your cell phone whenever, you're, whenever I'm getting too boring, um, uh, if you have cell phone reception here. Um, uh, uh, so about uh, one a month, we continue that, and we also have an online magazine, all of this free of charge, and in fact, we had a number of exhibitions last year where the exhibition catalog uh, was published only online. And this is especially popular with uh, fashion exhibitions. We, uh, one of our um, strategic priorities is fashion exhibitions. And since the audiences are very young for these, they love to have the direct access to, that, to the catalog on their uh, cell phones. Um, the same with Instagram, with these numbers were at the beginning of the year we have now 325,000 um, followers, and we're growing very, very uh, fast. Uh, Twitter, we're growing much less fast, but the reason is that we uh, give um, uh, information for actual users. So when we need to close a gallery or so, this is uh, something that we give on Twitter. We might be uh, remodeling this very uh, soon. And then, as you've already heard with almost all the other museums this morning, we also do live. Uh, events, which is something that the museums did from the very beginning, uh, such as here. Um, uh, you see this uh, wonderful festival, um, uh, festive event in 1739. Um, our biggest blockbuster in that regard is our uh, series of movies, which we uh, now project uh, for, the first, uh, for the third time this year in the summer. Every night at 10 p.m., um, uh, we uh, project movies, uh, and it's free of charge. We have now uh, 300 seats, but uh, sometimes far more people come, and they ju can just sit down on the on the stairs of the lodge, and some actually stand. Um, uh, and um, uh, sometimes the seats aren't even taken, but uh, young couples oftentimes like to lit sit in the lodge, which normally isn't uh, that much lit, as in this particular. Um, a picture, um, and uh, we have a vast variety of, of movies. We have um, a festival of South American cinema, for instance. This year, for the first time, we have a festival of Russian uh, cinema, and uh, the directors come to Florence for that purpose. We have a documentary film festival, and of course, we have uh, uh, movies uh, 
which connect with the exhibitions that we have on view. Um, at the moment, um, you know, we are celebrating the 500 years of Cosimo I, our uh, original builder, uh, the, uh, the patron of uh, the uh, Uffizi as a building, and uh, we have an exhibition on Jewish textiles and uh, have a film series on uh, in relation to that uh, as well. Um, and on art in the museum, that's another uh, uh, theme uh, which uh, goes through all the time. And in fact, two years ago, we also uh, hosted or, or produced uh, the first exhibition at the Uffizi dedicated to movies to Sergei Eisenstein, uh, which um, uh, brought, uh, was consisted of his original drawings, which came from the Academy of Arts and Science in Moscow, and then large-scale projections, uh, which we hosted in uh, the Uffizi on the inside. So uh, it's every year it's uh, 48. Um, well, this year it's actually more. Uh, this year um, it's uh, 52 uh, evenings, and last year we counted 13,000 uh, um, visitors who came to see the movies. But we also have dance theater music in the galleries that interpret the works of art. So we don't like to add just music from the same period, but really to interpret art uh, from new angles in a creative uh, way. Uh, in fact, we um, regularly host on our website opening where people are uh, can send in uh, their proposals. And we had uh, participants from all over uh, Europe, uh, actually two groups from Spain also last uh, yeah, and this uh, was just a few days ago for the opening of the Florence Dance Festival. We had the Kibbutz uh, Dance Company also uh, on occasion of our exhibition of the um, Jewish textiles. And you can see how this group with their choreography, which they developed on purpose for this particular space, you see Rubens behind, or then the uh, Niobids uh, before, they really teased out this very, very strong choreographic um, uh, narrative principle of these Hellenistic uh, statues. Uh, but we also had um, a group of high school uh, students uh, of the uh, classical um, high school that uh, recited from Virgil's Aeneid um, uh, last year. And uh, uh, this, um, we, these activities, I mean, we are labeled under Uffizi uh, Live. So last year we had 42 of these events. Another priority for us is uh, women artists. This is a subject that also came up earlier in other uh, talks. Uh, the Uffizi is actually the museum with the largest uh, collection um, of uh, women artists. Um, uh, until the 19th century, uh, and many of these have been in storage. We've started to bring them out and install them, and uh, to highlight them also through uh, a double series of two exhibitions every year, one dedicated to an artist, uh, to a woman artist of the past, and one uh, dedicated to a uh, woman uh, artist of uh, the present. Uh, we started with Suor Plautilanelli, a Florentine nun also active in Prato from uh, the school of San Marco, so a very careful, uh, I mean, she was actually very uh, close friend of Fra Bartolomeo, and um, uh, Fra Bartolomeo left his drawings to her. Um, uh, so he, uh, she would have uh, been delighted if uh, she would be still alive to have uh, been able to come to Madrid to see the um, uh, Fra Angelico exhibition uh, because uh, this was her uh, artistic ideal, um, and um, uh, th th this was the opening exhibition of that, um, but we also uh, dedicated several activities to uh, Artemisia Gentileschi, of course, uh, who is now, in terms of social media, um, together with Caravaggio, the most famous artist in the Uffizi, so um, in fact, if you look at the number of likes. Uh, she um, outnumbers even Botticelli, Leonardo, Michelangelo, and Raphael. Um, and um, um, uh, we do also have a very sizable uh, collection of her work uh, between uh, the Uffizi and the uh, Pitti uh, Palace. And uh, at the moment, we're actually um, uh, doing technological research on all these uh, paintings, which has never been 
uh, done uh, before, and uh, it was very exciting uh, to see that uh, she loved to change her composition on the canvas uh, rather than changing it on uh, a drawing and um, uh, and then just um, blowing it up on the canvas. Uh, then we uh, started our uh, our series of um, the women artists of the present with Maria Lasnik, the Austri famous Austrian uh, artist, also uh, active uh, in New York for many, many years. Um, in fact, uh, we also have her self-portrait in our uh, self-portrait galleries, and we continued with Elisabetta uh, Sirani in the following year, um, uh, and uh, with this uh, precious loan uh, from uh, the Pushkin Museum, uh, uh, this is her self-portrait, which unfortunately we do not have. This is uh, one of the few uh, historical self-portraits that is not in our uh, collection. And we uh, did another exhibition on uh, women and music in the, uh, between the late 16th and the early 17th uh, century. Um, actually not in the Uffizi. We also every year produce about five uh, to six exhibitions for the ter territory in Florence in order to really get close to the people who uh, live in towns from which painters originally came or where that have a historical connection to the uh, painters. And we continued with the uh, artist from Sard uh, Sardinia, Maria Lai. And um, uh, um, uh, in fact, this, this year, we dedicated the historical exhibition to the beginning of the women's movement in the 19th century. We have in very interesting documents in our collection from that, and the contemporary exhibition uh, to Kiki Smith. Um, we also did um, uh, a editathon with uh, Wikipedia in our library. This is our historical library uh, designed uh, by Giovanni Battista for Gini uh, in the 17 teens, which is still our, our library uh, today, although it has grown uh, a lot, and we use that for these activities to get more uh, uh, scholarly uh, voices out there on uh, women artists who are, who are otherwise not easily accessible on, on the web. And this is the group uh, that participated in this first dissertation um, in 2018. And an, another uh, exhibition that we actually opened on the occasion of the International Day um, against uh, violence against uh, women, um, uh, that is on November the 25th. Uh, we uh, opened this exhibition on the rape of um, Polyxena uh, and the iconographical, iconographical tradition of this um, sculpture. Again, the public uh, today has become far more diverse than it used to be. One of the projects that we initiated um, uh, in this regard is um, uh, that we invited groups of different people of different origins in Florence, and in five different steps, we uh, developed stories that connect uh, the iconography, but also the style, the representation of our uh, works of art in group sessions during the closure of the day, um, in order to really bring out, connect cultures, get a personal take and a different take from an intercultural standpoint. This is something that is being done by our Department of uh, Cultural Mediation. Um, and these were then registered and edited together. And um, uh, then uh, famous theater actors actually spoke it. And it's available on our website. Um, uh, and it's a very, very personal, very, very intercultural approach to uh, uh, masterworks that one would look at normally and think, well, we've already seen everything. We already know everything about it. But then again, you make these connections to, to the culture of different, of different countries, even for a work so famous as Botticelli's uh, Primavera. And uh, this is just the beginning. These were the first countries that were involved in this project. But it's an ongoing project, so we're going um, through this. Uh, presently with uh, people from different countries. And of course, we also do, this is very important, bring them in contact uh, with one another, not just uh, with the work of art. So it's not isolated people from Egypt, for, for instance, or Morocco, but it's also 
people um, than talking to one another uh, there. We also last year uh, hosted the first uh, exhibition uh, of a, an African um, artist, African-born and trained artist, Tisfaye uh, uh, Urgesa. Uh, the title is German because he now lives and teaches uh, in uh, Stuttgart in Germany. Um, uh, but again, this shows um, uh, our opening, which is fully in line with the Medici's uh, collections, which always were uh, never a regional museum, I mean, never a regional collection, but they were always open to the entirety of Italy, especially from uh, Sicily from uh, to Lombardy and uh, Venice, but also to the entirety of the world. That's why, for instance, we do have some of the oldest documented um, artworks from Sub-Saharan Africa, which came to Florence in uh, the very beginning of the 16th century um, as um, diplomatic uh, gifts. Uh, this uh, broader opening also informs our exhibition program, uh, and uh, we see that uh, the uh, visitors actually appreciate that. Um, where last year's second most visited museum was Islam in Florence with 660,000 visitors. I should uh, underscore that these numbers uh, are these, uh, we have the principle that we do not sell separate tickets for the exhibition, so it's very well possible that uh, people went to the, to the Uffizi to see Botticelli, but then also they did actually see the exhibition too. So, I mean, uh, it's, uh, it is still uh, real numbers, but this is a principle that we decided on purpose to follow in order to uh, also give less, um, uh, I mean, more novel subject uh, a chance rather than uh, outsourcing and separating the economy of the uh, exhibitions. Uh, but the, the principle to really uh, put um, uh, education and mediation into the center and accessibility in the center very much informs also our new uh, museum spaces, uh, of which just last year we opened 31 new galleries. Um, uh, we uh, rehung uh, 13 uh, rooms and opened 18 completely new uh, rooms um, after having started already with um, Botticelli the year before. Now last year it was Michelangelo Leonardo Caravaggio to Rembrandt and uh, also Masaccio Masolino Filippo Lippi, which we will go through a further uh, reiteration, the very last one. We uh, opened uh, the um, 12 galleries of the Contini Bonacossi uh, collection as well, uh, which um, was a very important gift to the nation in, in 1969, uh, but um, it was not possible as the original donor's contract um, uh, actually foresaw to open it within six months within the exhibition. We opened it 49 years later, but now it's really open and um, uh, centerpiece is the um, San Lorenzo by uh, Bernini. Here you see some of the uh, first uh, works, uh, the first uh, uh, galleries that we redid, the Botticelli galleries. We decided in the end to not have permanently benches in these rooms, but we have benches now um, along uh, all the corridors uh, so that you can go into this room and then go out. We do hypothesize to put in the benches just for the low season between November and February, uh, but in the high season it's just impossible. Um, and uh, here you also see the new cases that we designed uh, with a particular glass that protects uh, the paintings. Uh, even if you have um, 10,000 people breathing at the painting from a close distance, as happens when we are opened until 10 p.m. Uh, in the summer months uh, for um, a one day a week, uh, then um, still the microclimate behind the glass, uh, which is also an anti-attack glass uh, um, and an anti-reflective glass, so many people only notice that there is a glass when they touch it with their noses. Um, this uh, uh, makes sure that the uh, humidity and the temperature behind the glass st stays the same. So, I mean, there's not this uh, constant tear and wear uh, from everyday usage, but it's also a protection against potential madmen who, as we know, typically like to attack um, famous works of art. Um, 
Uh, this is a while we are installing the new Leonardo uh, room after restoration at the Opificio Pietro Dura. Five years and five months, the adoration of the Magi came back and was included in this um, case as well as the uh, Annunciation um, and uh, Verrocchio and Leonardo's baptism uh, as well. And this is the room where, uh, which you saw in Thomas Patch's uh, painting, uh, Mitch mixed over with uh, the um, uh, with the Tribuna uh, sculptures. And this is the room dedicated to Leonardo and uh, Raphael, where, in a way, uh, similar to what Mikhail Piotrovsky mentioned this morning about. Um, the uh, Morosov and Shchukin collections, and we put the two patrons, um, uh, the um, Mr. and Mrs. Stoney, next to the famous uh, Tondo, which they commissioned also to pay homage to them. And of course, uh, their painting was painted by Raphael, um, trying to outdo the Mona Lisa which we don't have, but we also don't need because um, uh, Raphael, we, we, everyone knows it, and uh, just looking at the, uh, these two paintings, it's very clear how um, Raphael used the model of the Mona Lisa for the pose and tried to improve on her. Uh, we leave it to the audience to decide whether who of the two won this competition. Um, um, and, and, and here also uh, we brought in sculptures that really uh, are meant to be thought-provoking and seem to be thought-provoking because we actually see that now the people do not just concentrate around the two or three masterpieces that they know, but they actually um, spread out in the entire gallery and go back and forth and look at everything. Uh, and as you see, there is also uh, Fra Bartolomeo included because one cannot talk about Raphael in Florence without mentioning the other great master uh, of the first decade of the 16th century in Florence, which was Fra Bartolomeo. And um, we hope that he will become more well known thanks to this uh, inclusion in, in this uh, uh, gallery. As, as some of you know, I mean, there are uh, ninja turtles uh, uh, named after Raphael and Michelangelo, but no ninja turtle uh, after Fra Bartolomeo. So uh, it's not our hope that there will be a ninja out of that, but it's just our hope that Fra Bartolomeo will get his um, historical due, just as the women artists I um, uh, showed you uh, before. And of course, needless to say, I mean, uh, our architect uh, studied very carefully the uh, Florentine architecture, and this was reconstructed in this recent exhibition by Massimo Listri, uh, to come up with the shapes that were used in this uh, room. We did reinstall also our gallery dedicated to Caravaggio and the early uh, 17th century. And on purpose, it goes from Caravaggio to Rembrandt uh, to have these two extremes and to combine uh, south and north. And here you do see uh, Rembrandt at the very end um, of this series of uh, galleries for which we uh, used a, an actual uh, textile from the 17th, from the very early 17th century as a model for the color. The, these, these colors that we use are all being built up according to historical painting techniques. So it's not one color that's mixed, but it's actually 10 to 15 layers of colors. And so, for instance, when we start, and these need to be different colors, of course, uh, that you go through, that means that it's a lively color. It works all, like, a, like a textile. And this is a technique that was practiced in Florence for um, hundreds of years. Um, when we started these galleries, actually, we had to start with a grounding layer of uh, very pink. So, I mean, we had some, um, some of our colleagues who came in and said, are you really sure that you got the right color here? But we uh, tuned it down then. And the same is, of course, true with the continued Bonacossi collection around Bernini, which I already mentioned. Um, and uh, we did leave uh, the paintings wherever there were historical framings uh, with velvet, as was so popular in the late 19th and very early 20th century. We left these in this context. And according to the uh, history of taste, of course, we, do, we did leave the ceramics with it, which was a very, very important uh, part in their collection history. Now, the most recent newly installed galleries, which we opened just three weeks ago, I believe three or four weeks ago, um, are dedicated to the 16th uh, century. And 
Again, now we do have the most important figure in 16th century Florence in the center of the room, which is Eleonora of Toledo. So this is not just an homage to uh, Spain that we uh, put her in, in the center, but uh, as everyone who reads Cellini's autobiography uh, or any other text of the 16th century knows, it was not Cosimo I, but it was Eleonora de Toledo who ultimately decided of what was built and uh, who was uh, commissioned and what was uh, bought. We also installed uh, the large altarpieces of the Counter uh, Reformation in the Hall of the Pilaster. Um, and after uh, almost 10 years that it was not shown, uh, finally uh, Federico Barocci's uh, Madonna del Popolo went back on view. Um, and we have another painting of the Noli Mitangeri uh, by Federico Barocci next to it. On the other side, actually, it's, uh, we have the same subject, the Noli, uh, Noli Mitangeri by Lavinia Fontana, um, which uh, uh, we installed in order to really show more masterpieces by women artists, uh, but we will be sending it to the Prado um, in a few months' uh, time so that uh, you uh, don't necessarily need to travel to Florence uh, to, to see uh, this, although we do hope that after the show you might uh, come. And um, uh, we have several thematic uh, galleries, such as uh, here uh, the, um, uh, the counter-reformed Studiolo uh, with paintings from the, second, from the late 16th and very early 17th century. Uh, and again, uh, we uh, were able to show some paintings that have never been on a view such as Andrea Comodi's Fall of the Angels, say the counter-reformed answer to uh, Michelangelo, uh, which scandalously was always uh, in storage and never shown permanently. And then the Venetian um, uh, galleries. Um, and uh, of course, uh, when we were choosing the color, we uh, were very pleased to see that uh, the Prado also for the uh, Lotto exhibition chose green. and. Uh, um, it's a very similar green to, to the one that the Prado uh, chose. Uh, we made experiments with paintings before. The reason why we chose it is because oftentimes in Venetian paintings of the time, we have the virgin before uh, green textiles, and uh, we um, uh, looked at those, and we, ex we were, that's why I called it Experimental Uffizi, the, the title of this uh, lecture. We, we experimented to find the right tone, and in fact, when it was the, 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 the third to last painting the, we actually installed by Sebastiano Prombo, which where you see exactly that very green that we chose uh, or based on empirical basis. So in a way, um, we, uh, I think um, uh, there's a particular reason why this actually does, does work. And here you see the layout of these uh, 14 most recent galleries installed. Um, we really... Um, and wanted to ensure that there's not just topographic, not just chronologic, and not just thematic um, criteria. All of them are present, but thanks to the axes that are being opened, uh, interesting juxtapositions um, are actually enabled, and we can see that people uh, going through these galleries uh, do um, actually perceive them. Also, we don't tell people whether they first need to go into the um, counter-reform studiolo or into the classical studiolo. Uh, uh, we really want to leave an openness uh, to all of this um, and in order also to show that the art history in the uh, 16th century was not linear. It was not as Hegel uh, imagined, but there were several different strands uh, that were intertwined and then uh, separated again. And so uh, uh, this was our uh, idea of giving really multiple narr narrations that each and every visitor might follow again. Now, presently, we're working on the gallery of the self-portraits, uh, which we're preparing um, the new galleries for. So there will be another 22 galleries to be opened um, in the next two or three uh, months and again, this cardinal, uh, almost cardinal's purple, which we chose in an exhibition uh, two years ago, is not the exact tone we chose. We do know that a cardinal's color was um, used uh, in the original installation of the self-portraits 
in the very same room that now is dedicated to Leonardo, which is where uh, Cosimo III uh, de' Medici, uh, in fact, left um, and installed uh, the collection of uh, self-portraits. Now the collection has grown so much, there are more than 2,000, uh, that we cannot keep them in one single room, and so we will be having them in, the, in an enfilade of rooms uh, next to the Uffizi uh, courtyard. And uh, what we also started to um, begin is the work on the Vasari Corridor. Uh, this, by the way, is one of the um, examples of uh, intersection of contemporary art and ancient art. For us, the, the most important criterion is that both the ancient work of art and the contemporary work of art uh, should gain through the uh, juxtaposition, and in this case with Ai Weiwei's video camera, um, whoever might have looked at the Corridor Vasariano and at the Ponte Vecchio only looking at its beauty is reminded that one of the functions that it originally served was that to uh, shield uh, the rulers from being seen by the people of Florence and at the same time to allow the rulers to surveil uh, the people on the street. Uh, in fact, uh, if you open the window, uh, one of these round windows at the corridoro, corridoio, we will be able to listen every to, uh, listen uh, to every single word that is being spoken on the street. Even nowadays, with all the traffic going on, uh, it must have been even more uh, decipherable in the 16th century. But on the other hand, also looking at uh, the video camera, which nowadays, of course, is a piece of the history of technology, um, because I waited this uh, about a decade ago, um, is uh, it also shows the, that there is a tradition to that, um, and it's nothing uh, particularly new. Um, here, the Corridoio, um, which um, uh, will be uh, reopening in uh, at the latest two years from now, perhaps a year and a half from now, um, uh, with its very, with its various uh, parts. We will have one room uh, which was heavily damaged uh, during the bombing by the Mafia in uh, 1993 on uh, May the 27th here, uh, which will be a memorial um, uh, for the Mafia bombing. And uh, then we will have another spot on the other side here, which will be um, which actually was totally destroyed in the night between the 3rd and the 4th of August 1944 by the Nazi army. And this will be a memorial to the Nazi destructions of uh, Florence in uh, World War II. And here you see that uh, it will be fully accessible uh, for uh, people with neuromotorical challenges who need to uh, visit with a wheelchair, but also to, to families with strollers, um, and you will be able to go through. This is only the architecture. We will be having uh, uh, some of the um, original frescoes that were on the outside of the Vasari Corridor, which um, are presently being restored and we'll be showing them on the inside uh, of it. Uh, to the right, you see the former um, hanging of the self-portrait collection, and as you see, mostly the, the, the collection was uh, full of shadows. You, you couldn't really see very much. And these are some of the other um, elevators that we are um, uh, building. We will be continuing uh, on the uh, south side of the Arno with uh, some uh, novelties in the Pitti Palace uh, as well, uh, such as the Museum of Carriages, um, on the northern Rondeau uh, here, then we will be restoring the uh, theater of the Rondeau. Uh, the treasury of the Medici will be reinstalled. Uh, we will be uh, having uh, new storerooms and we will have a new exhibition space uh, on the top floor at the moment. These are not uh, used at all. Um, we will also have a, a museum of tapestries and what has already been completed now, um, what has already been completed is the um, enlargement of the Museum of Fashion and Costumes. 
uh, here another aerial uh, view of uh, all of this. Uh, there will, of course, also be, and some of this has already started, um, addition as and um, improvements of the Bobbley Gardens, but it would be going far too um, uh, far to go into any uh, detail here. I should remind you that uh, still we do really spend the majority of our money, which uh, thanks uh, to a recent museum reform, now we actually generate uh, four uh, very uh, basic uh, safety and maintenance, which in many cases has not been done for many, many years. For instance, we clean the facades of the Pitti Palace for the first time, and uh, as far as the bastions are concerned, which you see here, it's the first time since World War II that we uh, did this. They were all um, full of dirt. And now, finally, they have this beautiful honey color of the rest of the uh, palace. We also have started to acquire again. Uh, just last year, we received 11 donations, and we made 30, 53 acquisitions, uh, out of which uh, perhaps the most important one uh, was Daniel de Volterra's uh, profit, uh, which uh, was, um, in fact, part of the acquisitions of the year in Apollo magazine. Uh, but we also acquired um, a, a very, very rare uh, painting by Johann Paul Schor um, of the Carnival uh, Thursday of 1664. Um, and, and we, again, with every acquisition, we take this as a, an opportunity to uh, carry out in-depth research. And, uh, and in many cases, uh, it will be at the center of an exhibition, as in this case, it was an exhibition dedicated to Johann Paul uh, Schor from uh, Innsbruck. Uh, um, and uh, while we were putting up this exhibition, uh, uh, we, uh, it came to our knowledge that um, a very, very rare, in fact, as far as we now know, uh, right now, unique uh, cradle, although we do know from documents that there have been several uh, cradles um, of this kind mentioned by the uh, two brothers, uh, Johann Paul and Egid Schor, uh, who worked really as um, Bernini's right hand and designers. Um, that, uh, so we bought this cradle, which was really in a very, very uh, good condition above all, uh, because thankfully, in recent um, years, probably since the 19th century, it was used uh, to put flowers in it, but uh, actually they um, uh, put a kind of um, bathing pot around it so that uh, no uh, water actually ever dropped onto to the wood. So we're very pleased uh, with that. And I think this is probably the last slide. Yes, indeed. Um, uh, so uh, this brings us back, of course, from starting, uh, starting with Madrid uh, and uh, going via Austria, and this uh, brings us back via Austria to Madrid. Thank you very much. Muchísimas gracias y que enhorabuena por la magnífica intervención.